Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Amen. Open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes 2. Verses 9 through 11. Last week we said that it's not just at Christmas time, but every day of the year, perhaps one of life's biggest questions is, what do I want out of life? What do I really want out of life? What am I expecting and what am I hoping for? What are my goals and how do I get there and where am I heading now? And we said, as fallen human beings so easily entangled by our own sinfulness, even our wants and our desires can become confused and conflicted and entangled. And sometimes it's hard to know what we want at all. It's hard to make a decision. We said very often that we can find ourselves 10, 20, 30 years later wondering whether or not we made the right decisions with our lives and assessing whether or not we're truly happy. So we're in a very short sermon series leading up to Christmas called, What Do I Really Want Out of Life? And last week we talked about home. And in this entire series, we're using Romans eleven thirty three 33 through 12, 2 as kind of our foundational passage. So I'm going to read that again right now. It says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Last week we said that one of the ways we conform to the world's way of looking for fulfillment is in our search for home. Because due to the corruption of sin in our world, we can never truly find home in the world. But we do have a home to come. We are awaiting an eternal city that can never be taken away and in which there will be no crying or sadness or death. This morning we're looking at two other ways we conform to the world by looking for purpose and meaning out of life and we're talking about how we do that through work and play. How do we conform to the world's way of searching for meaning and purpose? How do we conform to the world's way of looking for what we want out of life through our work and our play? And we look now to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done, and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity, and striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we pray today by your grace and by your mercy that you would pour out your favor on us by speaking to us. Lord, we thank you for these ancient words which are true forever. 
And Lord, we thank you for how they apply to our lives today. And God, we ask that you would use this time to speak to us as a congregation, but also as individuals. Lord, open our hearts to receive your word. Open our ears to hear and our eyes to see the truth of your word. God, I pray that you would speak through me and help me as the preacher not to be a distraction from your word today. God, speak to me as well as we ask that you speak to all of us. Lord, we thank you for your grace in our lives and we thank you that you are here present with us this morning as you've promised to be. And again, we ask now that you would use this time for your glory and to make us more like Christ our Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Some of you this morning, one of the last things that you think of when you think about finding meaning and purpose and fulfillment out of life is work. And you may be asking yourself, who in the world likes to work? Well, maybe you don't, but there's a lot of people who do. In fact, some people we would say are addicted to work. We would call them workaholics. There are people who are driven by their careers, and sometimes we tend to think that their only motive is money and success. And while that's certainly a motive for some, it's not necessarily the case for all. For some, the motive may simply be the rush of accomplishing a task. Still, for others, it may be fear of loss or fear of financial dependency. And for others, it may simply be that they found a way to make money from their hobby. They made their hobby profitable. But for many people, work can become an idol. The more we get done and the more hours we put in, the bigger the rush and the better we feel. But understand, while there's nothing wrong with a sense of excitement for getting things done, in fact, God has commanded us to work, when anything in our lives other than Christ becomes the driving factor of who we are, then that thing has become an idol become an idol in our lives. So what's a worldly alternative to work? Well, that would be play. Some people say that I work hard so I can play hard. For some people, it's not that they enjoy work at all, but rather they enjoy what work can give them, what it can afford to them. You may find someone who isn't fulfilled in and has no sense of meaning in their work at all, but they work multiple jobs and multiple hours because they know that that amount of work can afford them the kind of lifestyle that they hope to live. Again, the motives can vary. It could be a longing for fun or adventure or excitement or entertainment. But for many people, play is a driving Factor. It's how they derive their meaning out of life. And so if that's you, you typically find yourself plowing through most of the hours and days and weeks and months of your life, just waiting and pushing for the fun moments that you have planned and created for yourself to enjoy. For some, that could be a trip. For others, a vacation. Some people live for the weekends. Some people are just focused on retirement. Our lives are treated almost like suffering that we have to endure so that we can get to the real living, which only comes ever so often. But brothers and sisters, surely that's not how life is supposed to work. Surely it's not the case that most of our lives are a waste, waiting around for the good parts. Again, there's absolutely nothing wrong inherently with fun. There's nothing wrong with excitement and enjoyment and vacation. There's nothing inherently wrong with rest and with entertainment. But just like with work, when anything other than Christ becomes the driving factor in our lives, that thing has become an idol. And idols always pull us away from our Lord. And be certain, brothers and sisters, idols always disappoint us. They always fail to deliver on their promises. Ultimately, just like with anything else in our lives, work falls by the wayside. Our bodies get old. 
We can't do as much as we once did. We can't think the way we once could. And the one who would devote himself to work finds himself frustrated and longing for the good old days. Work, just like home, is fleeting. And play, like anything else, is fleeting. The weekend always comes to an end. The vacation always comes to an end. The game night comes to an end. And then it's back to the real world. And how is it that we come to distinguish the real world as being so miserable? Because understand, even if you have access to play at all times, consider the celebrity world. Isn't it ironic that the people who have access to possibly Anything you could imagine are some of the most miserable people alive. There's a reason the world's richest, most famous people are so often on drugs or suffering with some kind of addiction or hopping from one spouse to the next or seeking thrills and adrenaline rushes all the time. It's all because their success and all their access to everything doesn't bring them any kind of joy at all. They are desperately seeking something that they don't even know how to describe. And ultimately, their hearts aren't seeking a something at all, but rather a someone. They're longing for Christ. They're longing for Jesus, even if they don't know it, and even if they may actively deny it. They are longing for the one that their idols cannot replace or replicate. Our passage here says in verse 10, All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind and there was no profit under the sun. A couple of years ago I mentioned that Ecclesiastes was written by two authors and we don't know who either of them are. There's some pretty good guesses out there. But the first author wrote chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 And he also wrote the end, chapter 12, verses 8 through 14. And the second author wrote everything that comes in between. And the first author is using everything that comes in between as a foil. He's saying, don't go down this path. Don't run around and try to search for meaning in worldly things. Don't go around looking for meaning where meaning cannot be found. And don't be a cynic. And the conclusion to the book of Ecclesiastes is found in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. He writes this. The conclusion when all has been heard is, Fear God and keep His commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So church, what do our lives look like when we don't conform to the world's way of looking at work and play, but rather when we are transformed by the new life that Christ gives? The Apostle Paul was a hard worker, but his work was brought to a screeching halt when he was imprisoned for preaching the gospel. Now, by trade, he was a tent maker and a leather worker. That's how he fed himself. But he also worked hard at preaching and teaching the word of God, often facing harsh persecution for that. And so if work, even for the gospel, had been where he had found his meaning in life, you can imagine he would be very frustrated and depressed being kept in a Roman prison for preaching Jesus. But instead... Paul was filled with joy because he had Christ. He found his purpose and his meaning in Christ. He rejoiced over the giver more than the gifts. And he wrote to the Philippian church in chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. 
He wrote, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Paul said, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Again, we find echoes of Romans 11 and 12. And again, we see that word, sacrifice. A drink offering, he says in verse 17, that was a sacrifice poured out to the Lord. And Paul says that's what his life is like. The work that he does, the life that he lives, is one offered as a living sacrifice to God. His blood, sweat, and tears are poured out not for himself and not for his own gain, but for the sake and the glory of Christ. And ultimately, that's what his death would be like too. Paul would be poured out for the Lord. His life would be taken from him, publicly shamed and executed for the glory of Christ. And yet he rejoiced. Why? Because his work was the work of the Lord. His life was a sacrifice to the Lord. His priority was God. And this is why he was able to write to the Colossians, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Church, work is good. But work cannot satisfy. Work can leave one empty and an addiction to work has led to the destruction of many individuals and many families. But living as a living sacrifice to the Lord only brings satisfaction. It only brings lasting joy and peace. And likewise, play can be good. But play cannot satisfy. Play also can leave one empty. And an addiction to the fun and exciting moments of life has also led to the destruction of many people and many families. So what in the world are we looking for? What can satisfy? Again, Paul from his prison cell paints a vivid picture. In Philippians 3, he describes the life he lived before he knew Christ as his Lord and Savior. And the picture that he paints is one of admiration from his peers, excitement for his work, zeal for his Jewish religion, and what he thought was good standing before God. He thought of himself as righteous before the Lord. Paul, no doubt, enjoyed his life. That was before he met Christ. And then he so powerfully writes in Philippians 3, verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him." Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. 
brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, one fateful day, while I was on the road to Damascus to do what I did best. The risen Savior, Jesus Christ, got a hold of me. He changed me. He gave me life. He brought me out of my living grave so that I might truly live. And He washed me clean of all my horrible sins and of my arrogance. He got a hold of me and now my life's goal, my ambition, my aim, my purpose, my fulfillment is just trying to get a better hold of Him. Church, whether it's work or play or home or any other idol in your life, it can never Bring satisfaction. It can't. Your heart was made for the Lord. And your heart will be restless until it rests in Him. So how do we respond this morning? Well, first, if you've never received Christ as your Savior, you need to be saved. Jesus called it being born again. It's the moment a person goes from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And it's also the moment that a person's sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven forever. You may wonder how that's possible. Well, it's possible because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and He lived a perfect, sinless life. He established a perfect record before God and then He was crucified on the cross in our place. He died a sinner's death and was buried in our place. But on the third day, He rose from the dead never to die again. And because of the fact that we could never be perfect and our good deeds could never make up for even one of our sins, Jesus paid the price for our sins and made it so that if we will simply turn from those sins and believe on Him, we will be saved. When we receive simply His free gift of the payment for our sins, we are saved. And upon receiving Him as Savior, then we embark on a life of truly living. A life of following Him and having a personal relationship with Him. And so this morning, if you've never been saved, you need to respond to the Savior. And this morning, if you think you've already been saved, but... The concept of having a living and active relationship with Jesus is foreign to you. If you've never truly experienced knowing Christ and Him being in your life, you need to pray and you need to ask the Lord to save you. Because when we are saved, we truly know and commune with the Lord. We have an actual present day relationship with Him. And that's how we find joy and purpose in our lives. Those aren't just concepts, not just platitudes. If you've been saved, you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know Him personally and experience His presence in your life. Finally, this morning, if you do have a relationship with Christ, how can you respond? As we saw last week, Again, Romans 12, 2. By not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not allow yourself to be fooled into thinking that either work or play can provide you with satisfaction in life. 
Satisfaction can only come from drawing near to the Lord and living your life for Him. As a human being made in the image of God, your heart longs to draw near to Him. Your heart longs to serve Him. And you will be tempted to rage against that. Tempted to think that anything else in the world would be better than to serve the Lord. But again, our hearts are restless until they rest in Him. What you really want out of life if you've truly been saved, is Christ. And your purpose and meaning and fulfillment and joy are found in Him. Don't make the mistake of thinking it can be found anywhere else. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lavish amount of grace that you've shown us as your people. God, even in our sins before we knew you, you loved us. God, you came for us, you suffered and died for us, and was buried and rose again that we might have life in your name. Lord, we thank you that you've drawn us to yourself. And we pray, God, today, if there be anyone who has not received you as Savior, that you would graciously convict them of sins now and draw them to be saved. Draw them to Jesus Christ. God, as your people who have received you, we recognize that it is so very easy to see all the bright and shiny things in our world. And Lord, to think that they can give us joy and purpose and meaning in life. And God, we thank you for every good gift that you've given us. We thank you for your provision to us. We thank you for the blessings in our lives. But Lord, help us never to find our soul's contentment in the gifts you give, but rather in you and in you alone. Lord, help us to draw near this morning and to lay any of our idols aside and to find that your grace is still sufficient even today. God, make us more like Christ, your son, and use us for your glory and help us to spread the gospel. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.